Schoenstatt's teaching on the practical faith in divine providence unfolds before us the treasures needed to unite our will with the will of God so that in our daily lives we do prove by our deeds that we truly love the Blessed Mother and the Triune God. So what I would like to do is to unfold this teaching on the practical faith in divine providence. Because when we take this, when we live it, then we are living in union with God's will. We receive all the tools that are necessary so that we can be one with God's will, that we can prove our love by doing His will. So we want to look briefly at this teaching, and you will find that on page 92 in your booklet. When I talk about divine providence, I like to begin by a little introduction of looking at what I call the disease of godlessness. We live in a time where we have cast God out of our lives, out of our society, out of our schools, and so on. It's a disease. And when we look at a disease, we ask several questions. First of all, what is the manifestation of the disease? How does the disease show itself? Is there a rash? Is there a tumor? How does it show itself? And the second question we ask ourselves, what are the causes of this disease? What causes it? And of course, the third question, which we are most interested in, is what is the cure? If you look on page 92, you have some of the ways in which the disease manifests itself. Let us look at those. One way in which this disease manifests itself, shows itself, is for many people, God is what we consider the 911 God or the God of convenience. When I need him, he better be there. And when I don't need him, I don't want him involved in my life. And for some people, that is how they see God. Now, many people love God, they follow God, we know that. But there are many who do not. And so what we are doing is looking at the negative. Secondly, for some people, God is the distant God. They give him credit for creating the universe, but now it's like he simply is observing from a distance. No direct involvement. It's like the idea of being in a big theater. And if you're in the way back corner of that theater, you can only see the people on the stage like tiny little dots. And for some people, that's how they see the relationship with God. He's just watching. He's observing. Father Kentinick, on the other hand, said, it's like we're all on a stage. And the whole drama is the plan of salvation. And God, is he involved? Oh, yes. He's the producer of the play. He's the director of the play. Mm, he's very involved. And he's the main actor in this whole drama. And we know when there's a play going on, everybody takes their cues from the main actor or main actress. So you see, God is very much involved. He's not a distant God. Also, for many people, they suffer from a distorted image of God. This is how the disease manifests itself. And if you have a distorted image of God, that is how you're going to relate to him. So if my image of God is that of a dictator, a judge, a cruel judge, a policeman, I will relate to him accordingly. But if my image of God is this loving and caring father, my relationship will be totally different. And unfortunately, this is one of the major problems we have in our society today is this distorted image of who God is. And we will see why that is in just a minute. Another manifestation of this disease is atheism. If you look up atheism in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 
you will find it said there that this is one of the most serious problems prevalent in our world today. God doesn't exist. And if God doesn't exist, if there's no God, look at the consequences, which we see today. The first consequence is, then is there sin? Because sin is turning away from God. If there's no God, then can there be sin? Secondly, if there is no God, is there an afterlife? Well, heaven is being in the presence of God for all eternity and hell is being in the absence of God. If there is no God, then is there heaven? Is there hell? If there is not, okay, live it up because when you're done, you're done. That's it, it's finished. The second thing with atheism is if there is no God, then I have to find a substitute God. Because when God created us, he put within us this longing for him. And if I don't fulfill it, fill it with the true God, then it makes me restless. As St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. So I have to look for substitutes, drugs, alcohol, whatever it might be, but it doesn't satisfy me. So I need more and more and more. This is a consequence of this atheistic mentality. Another manifestation of this godlessness is agnostics. They believe there's a God, but they really can't explain it, so I don't really have much to do with it. Another manifestation is the New Age movement. Now, the New Age movement has many facets. They have this belief, I am God. I'm not created in his image and likeness, I am him. And for me, the most profound way of looking at this new age, putting it all together, is a quote from Shirley MacLaine that I read someplace, where she said, you shall worship no one other than self. We worship only, worship is only for God. And now she says, you shall worship no one other than self. That's a new age mentality. I am God. And so these are just some of the manifestations of this disease. I'm sure we could come up with many others. So now let us look at what are the causes of this disease? How do we get there? Of course, the first cause is original sin. We know that in the garden, Adam and Eve walked with God, and then they sinned. And what happened? They hid from God. From that moment came the break, not on God's side, but on the side of the human being. And since that moment, we struggle with that relationship with God. We come to him, we surrender to him, and then we go away again. The entire history of mankind plays this out. So the very beginning of this break, the cause of the disease is original sin. Then in our time, we see other effects. For example, technology. Technology in itself is good. But if you just think over the years, the last 20, 50 years, how fast things have progressed. Think of all the things we can do in medicine. And the danger is, because we suffer anyway from this disease of pride, in the fast development of technology, we start to pat ourselves on the shoulder and say, look what I have done. Instead of saying, look what the gifts God has given me to discover this or to be able to do this. Because it's vast, the technology. Another cause of the disease, I think, is the media. How much do we receive from the media that leads us closer to God? Oh, there are some things. There are some good things, EWTN, for example, but how many negative things there are. I think it is a tool that Satan uses successfully, the media. Bishop Sheen, in all of his wisdom, said, when the TV came into the house, Satan came right behind him. The government, 
busyness. I think personally busyness is a tool that Satan uses in a magnificent way to affect our relationship to God. Many of you maybe have heard this story from C.S. Lewis where Satan is very upset one day and he tells his little devils, you know, you're not making the people bad enough. You've got to get down there and do something more. And they say to Satan, but what can we do? We've tried everything and we're not very successful, seemingly. And so Satan said, go back down there and try to really do something. So they went and then they came back and they each gave their little report. And the one said, well, I told the people that they don't have to believe in God because he doesn't really exist. And Satan said, we always say that. And then the next one came and tried to tell them, you know, um, you can lie and cheat and do whatever you need to get ahead because nobody else cares about you anyway. You're on your own. And Satan says, we always do that. And the other little one came back and he said, I tried to keep the people very busy and distracted so they couldn't develop this personal relationship with God. So what did you do? Well, I took care that music was played everywhere. So they're always distracted. And isn't it true wherever you go, there's noise? (laughs) You go to fill your gas tank, there's noise, there's music. And now some places have these little TV screens that talk to you. I told them, I I, I made sure that their mailboxes were filled with junk mail. That's distracting. How much junk mail do we get every day? Or when they go out in nature, I took care that there were billboards so they would be distracted. Oh, and what else I did was I encouraged them to go to church and, you know, and, and, and be reunited with God. And then when they come out of church, that they start this little gossip and, and picky little talking. And so they lose that relationship again. And on and on. All the things we see today. And it says at the end, was Satan successful? You be the judge. And then it says, be silent and know that I am God. All these distractions, this busyness, that we don't have time to develop that personal relationship to God. Cause of the disease. Another cause, which I think is probably the most influential, is the breakdown within the family. The loss of the role of the father, the loss of the role of the mother, and the loss of the role of the children. Let us look at each one of these very briefly. On page 93, it speaks about the loss of the father. This is very crucial. This is where Satan has really made an impact. Listen to what Father Kentenich said in 1950 about this difficulty with our relationship to God because of our difficulty with the relationship of the father on the natural level. He says, the longing for God has been repressed. Now, as I said, we have this longing for God. It cannot be taken out, but we can cover it with a lot of rubble, and that's what we have done. And what does he say the first reason for this longing for God that has been repressed? He tells us, the irrational root of our faith in God is diseased. Now, when we talk about the irrational root, we talk about way down into the subconscious, not our rational thinking process, subconscious. What is in our subconscious comes up and we act out of that more than our rational thinking. This irrational root is diseased. The irrational root of our faith in God, what is it? is the experience of a father on a natural level. An experience which penetrates the subconscious mind and in keeping with the law of transferring effects can and must be transferred to God the Father, the only one 
in whom we find a place of repose and security that helps us master all difficulties in the present daily storms. Do you grasp the vast scope of this far-reaching statement? Do I have reason for saying that we are living in fatherless times? Do I have reason for adding that because we are living in fatherless times, we are also living in a godless epoch? This is our problem. Now, when a child is born, they know who their mother is. They've been bonded to her for nine months. They know. And if there's all these mothers around looking at this new baby, that baby knows which one is their mother. But they don't know who their father is. That's the task of a good mother to lead the child to their father. How does she do that? She does it first and foremost by her devotion and love for her husband. And that somehow just goes through her into that little soul and helps the child to know who their father is. And then she does such things as daddy's home, daddy's going to take care of you, constantly directing the child to their father. They come to know who their father is. And then a good father and mother will teach their children many things. And one of the things they will teach them is about God. And they will probably say to the little one, God is your father. Now, this child has no clue who this God is. And so the child's going to relate to God as, some, as, as they would relate to their father, because they already know what a father is. And now they're saying, God is your father. Okay, I know who my daddy is. I know who my father is. But I don't know who this God is. But if he's also my father, he must be like my daddy. Okay? Now, if a child has a healthy experience of their father on a natural level, a father who cares about them, who loves them, who's educating them, who's involved in their life, that is their experience of who God is. A child's first experience of God is their father on a natural level. That's how God has set it up. He's allowed the father to share in his authority and be that tangible experience so that experience can penetrate into their subconscious and then they can transfer it to have a deep personal relationship to God as their father. That's the process. That's how God has designed it. Now, if a child has an experience of a father on a natural level who never has any time for them, just something like that, and then you say, God is your father, go to him, he's not going to have time for me. Do you see? Or a father who's a very severe disciplinarian. Discipline is good, but severe, not so good. And if that's my experience of my father on a natural level, that's how I will see God. I don't want to have anything to do with him. You see where this distorted image of God comes from. Very detrimental. It starts with the experience of a father on a natural level. We live in a fatherless time. There was a book that was, that came out, I think it was in 1994 or 1995, and the title was Fatherless America. And in there it shows very clearly how detrimental it is when the father is not present. In the introduction, it says something like, over a million children go to bed every night not knowing who their father is. And there's never been a time in the history of mankind where children have not been voluntarily abandoned by their fathers. And then it expresses in there of showing examples of, of young people, especially young men in prison, 95% of them had no father in their life. Then it also tells or uh, asks the question, why are little boys running around with guns today, real guns? And why are little girls running around with babies, not dolls, real babies? Because of the lack of the father. It is only the father who can lead a son into manhood. No mother can do it no matter how good she is. She's not a man. It's through the father that the, the son learns to become a real man. And with the daughter, 
if the father is involved in the life of his daughter, he cares about her, he, he cherishes her, she is comfortable with her sexuality and does not seek complementation outside. How important the father is. So we have today the loss of the father, which affects the child's relationship to God. Along with this, we have the loss of the role of the mother. It says if fatherliness is to develop, the father must be complemented by a true mother. It's needed. And if the mother isn't any longer fulfilling her role as the heart, being there to really complement her husband as the head so he can unfold his fatherliness, we have the problem we have today. Listen to how Father Kentenich defines this true mother, beautiful qualities. She is selfless, serving. She is filled with love, humility, and my favorite one, constant cheerfulness. She is patient, self-sacrificing, and self-surrendered. These are the qualities of a good mother needed to complement her husband so he can be that father he has been called to be. And then we also suffer from the loss of true childlikeness. You see, God set up his plan that we can experience everything on a natural level so we can really know it and then transfer it to God. Now we know we are to have this childlike relationship to God. But if I don't know what it means to be a child, how can I have that relationship to God? So God has designed it that we experience from the very beginning what it means to be a child on a natural level within our families. And unfortunately today, so many children are forced to be little grown-ups. They don't experience a true childhood in a healthy way so that they can then transfer it to God. For example, if you have a little eight-year-old who goes to school every day for eight hours, then she has all these activities, which are not bad in themselves, but can so consume her that she has no time to play to be a child. So then one day when you say, you know you're supposed to have this childlike relationship to God, just, oh, what does it mean to be a child? I've never experienced it. So you see, all this has been very, a serious cause of this disease of godlessness within the breakdown within the family. So we see the manifestations, we see the causes, and now, of course, we are most interested in what is the cure. There's a cure, and that's beautiful. The cure is the practical belief in divine providence that, as we're going to see, puts God right into the center of our lives where he belongs. On page 96, it gives a beautiful definition of divine providence. It says, divine providence is God's wise and fatherly care for his creation. In the literal sense of the word, providence means to see in advance. In this capacity of foresight, the infinite loving God has designed a plan of the world for us. So very simply, divine providence says, God wants to take care of us. And who can do a better job than God himself? So divine providence tells us that God did not just create us, put us down here and say, good luck, I hope you find your way back to heaven. He didn't do that. He wants to take care of us. He wants to provide for us on our journey home to him. Now, on the bottom of page 96 and the top of page 97, 
you see the different attributes of God. And I would encourage you to again reflect on these attributes by looking, for example, at the Catechism of the Catholic Church where you find these attributes as I have them listed, or also going into sacred scripture, especially the New Testament, and reading these different passages where Jesus tries to teach us who the Father is, like the Good Shepherd, for example, and then to say, this is the one who wants to take care of me. This is my Father. For example, we say God is almighty. There isn't anything he can do. He's the one who wants to take care of me. Again, I don't need to worry. I don't need to be anxious. And we all know this anxiety and this worry is a consequence of original sin. It's part of what we have to deal with. And that's why God in his infinite love and mercy said, in case you have never heard this, said 365 times in sacred scripture, do not be afraid, do not worry, do, be, do not be anxious in some form. Because he doesn't want us to. Because he's our father and he wants to take care of us and he wants to provide for us. So this is something you can look at, you can reflect on who is God? I know, but who is he really? And let those thoughts penetrate.